Okay. Good evening, everybody. The secret of the dreidel. The dreidel, a children's game played in the firelight, a Hanukkah menorah glowing silently in the corner. The dreidel, seemingly an anodyne children's game. And yet we'll see that this little dreidel contains the whole history of the world, the history of the Jewish people. Our story begins in, with the Pasha of Yaakov Avinu, last week's Pasha, seeing a, a ladder, a dream of a Sula Mutzav Arza with its foot, its base, stuck into the ground, the Rosho and its head reaching to the Shemaim, to the heavens. The Malchei Hashem and the angels of Hashem, Oldim, Oldim Vyordim, Bo. They were going up and down on this ladder. The Medrash says that these angels were not, I mean, it's difficult to use the word angels because in English you have, with angels you have this sort of picture of this guy with a white robe on and a fluorescent tube over his head. But when we talk about Malachim, Malachim are Shlichim, they're agents, they're, they're sent by Hashem. And these Malachim were actually Sarim. They were the spiritual powers of four great exiles, four great um, <coughs> empires who would rule the world and dominate the Jewish people. And they are chronologically Babylon, Bovel, Parasimodai, Persia and Medea. Yovan, which is of course the story of Hanukkah, Parasimodai and Medea is the story of uh, Purim, and Rome, Rome, Romi. And the Malachim that Yaakov Avinu saw in this ladder were the protecting powers of these four great nations. Yaakov first of all saw the Sa, the Malach of Babel, rise up 70 rungs on the ladder and then come down. The Jewish people were in exile in Babylon for 70 years. And then he saw the Malach of Poros Modai go up 52 rungs. The Jewish people were in exile 52 years <coughs> in Persia. And then he saw the Malach of Yavan, of Greece, going up the ladder, and he went up 180 years, and he came down. Now it has to be understood that when we talk about the exile of Yavan, the Jewish people were not technically, physically in exile. But the exile, the greatest exile can be, was when you're estranged from, from Yiddishkeit, from Judaism, from Torah, and you're still in your homeland. There's no greater exile than when a person feels he's at home and he's really lost contact with himself. That's the greatest exile. And then the Malach of Rome, of Romi. For this, the, and the Malach of Romi went up and up and up and up and up and didn't come down. And uh, Kodesh Baruch Hu, and Yaakov Avinu became very frightened. And the Kodesh Baruch Hu, reassured Yaakov Avinu with the words of this week's Haftorah, one of the opening words of this Haftorah by the prophet Avadia, who was a convert from the nation of Esau, of Edom, of Rome. This week's Parsha says at the end of this week's Parsha that the, the last of the kings of Rome, the uh, last kings of, of, of Edom, of Esau, of that line, is Rome. He was Rome. And the prophet Avadia says that the Kodesh Baruch Hu says to the, the Sar, of Rome, Im kinesha, if you'll rise up like an eagle and you'll make your, your, your nest amongst the stars, I'm going to bring you down even from there. We have a haftacha, we have a promise from Hashem that this exile, which has gone on for nearly 2,000 years, much, much longer than all the other exiles put together, eventually Hashem will bring the kingdom of Esau, of Edom, of Rome, that we're living in today. Why are we in the exile of Rome? So if you know anything a little bit about history, when the Roman Empire ruled the world, and then Constantine converted to Christianity. And when he, con he, created, when he uh, converted to Christianity, that was the beginning of what was called the Holy Roman Empire, which my history teacher at school used to say, which is neither Holy Roman nor an empire. The Holy Roman Empire basically begets two, um, sch a schismatic movement, which becomes in the West, Catholicism, and in the East, the, the uh, Eastern Church, the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox. But essentially, 
And of course, then what happens? The, the Western scion of, of, of Catholicism, of Christianity, dominates the rest Western world, and that transmutes into the Western capitalistic society that we live in today. So when we talk about Edom nowadays, basically what we're talking about is the materialistic culture of the West, which holds us in thrall to this day. But however much that culture goes, gets stronger and stronger and stronger, eventually, as Hashem promised through the words of Avadia, eventually he's going to bring down that Malach, that fourth Malach, who seems to be keep going on and on and up, upward, he'll bring him down. These are the four great exiles. Now, the number four is not by coincidence. The Maharal goes into great details about the idea of the number four. The number four always signifies something called Olam de Piruda, Alma de Piruda, the world of separation. Conceptually, if you think that anything which travels away from a central point, conceptually, it goes in four directions. We talk about the four compass points, the idea of traveling away from a central point is always four, and therefore the exiles are four. And these four exiles stand in direct opposition to the four letters of Hashem's name, yud kei vav -ke. And the four exiles stand in direct opposition to each one of the letters of Hashem's names. And with the overthrow of each of these nations, so there's nisbatal, there is nullified a certain power in the Bria. But eventually from them all to be nullified for them all to come to an end, we're waiting for Mashiach. Mashiach ben David, who will bring an end to the four exiles, and the kingship, the kingdom, will be re re will returned to Klal Israel. He will be, he'll return the kingship. It's interesting that each one of the four exiles has a certain animal connected to it. The animal which is connected to the last exile, the exile of Rome, is the pig, the chazir. Why? The, the chazir, the chazir, Sticks out. That's in this week's um, in um, uh, um, in the past when it talks about um, that Yaakov Vina became very fr uh, frightened. He was frightened of killing Esau. This week's Pasha, because he says that, he's, he, that um, and the Posik says I've forgotten the Posik. He says that he refers to uh, to Esau as uh, Esau and Achi. So we don't know that Esau is his brother. So I think it's the Briskorov says that Esau has two faces. He has the face of the Nazi of the Jew hater. And he also has the face of Achi, you are my you're my brother. And that soft <clears throat> asphyxiating embrace of Rome has caused a spiritual holocaust far greater than what the Germans Yamachima were able, able to do in Europe. If you look at the rates of intermarriage, the Shamas lost to the Jewish people in this last stages of the exile of, of Esau of Edom, it's quite horrendous. We don't see it as, or people don't see it as a, as a holocaust, but it's a silent holocaust. It's a holocaust of the soul. And that's Esau when he behaves like the brother. He's the last of the exiles. So we have Yaakov Avinu, we have a ladder, and... Yeah. How does that connect with the pig? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, we're... Yes, I would think that it would be like the eagle, because well, first of all, Rome's emblem was an eagle, and also you said in Avadia said you rise up like an eagle. Yeah, it's interesting. That's that's right. Very good. But not only that, there's an interesting coincidence. If you want to call it a coincidence, Ramosha Kalbach he should be well for Shalema. He used to say that uh, just as we can dash in Loshen Hakodesh, maybe we can also also dash in English. He said the word coincidence, maybe it's made up of two words, ka. What's ka? Ka is the way we say the name Yud and He. <coughs> when we don't when we want to pronounce, we don't want to say it because that's one of Hashem's names. So it's ka in silence. Hashem, so to speak, weaving circumstances to, to fulfill his end. So it may be just coincidence, but if you remember the first words that was uh, arguably the <coughs> excuse me, the summit of the achievement of the Western world was what? Let's let's take if you look at the last in the last thousand years, what was the, the greatest achievement that they, they managed to do? And what I would say, probably putting a man on the moon. This was like the summit of Aesov's, the Yadaim Yaday Aesov. Incredible skill uh, to be able to do such a thing. Something which was unthinkable 200 years ago. This is the subject of science fiction novels. And they did it. They put a man on the moon. What were the first words of the, when, the, when they landed on the moon? Houston? 
This is Tranquility Base. The eagle has landed. Just an interesting coincidence that the eagle happens to be Im Tagbiya Kanesha, as the Prophet of Adiyah says, if you rise up like an angel and make your nest amongst the stars, I'm going to throw you down even from them, says Hashem. Okay, it's not Chazal. It's an interesting idea. You can take it or leave it. But anyway, you're right. The eagle is the symbol of the Rome of Rome, but the symbol of Esau is the, the pig. Why? Because, as we said before, the pig has only one of the simonym of Kashrus. It has cloven hooves, but it doesn't regurgitate. It doesn't ruminate. And so it's 100% trafe. So Aesov, as we said, behaves sometimes like a murderous Nazi, and then sometimes he's, he's very nice. Come and join us. So that's Aesov when he pushes out his trotters and he says, look, I'm kosher, I'm your brother. But he's as trafe as trafe. Why is it, why is it the, the idea of, the, um, of, the, of the, the pig, the chazir? The concept is that each of these nations have basically stolen the malchus from Klal Yisrael. We had the Malchus. The Malchus was first of all appropriated, stolen by Bovel. Paris and Modai stole it from them. Greece stole it from them. Rome stole it from them. And eventually, Rome will be the nation to be Machzir. They will return the Malchus to Klal Yisrael. Machzir, to return, has the same root as the word Chazir. They will be the last ones on that, on that journey of exile. World historical exile of the Jewish people, they will be the last ones, and they will. But Zat Hashem, Bim return the, Klal, the Malchus to Klal Yisrael with the coming of Mashiach. Mashiach ben David. David, Melech Israel, he's the Malchus. Now, um, we're going to go look inside here. Uh, please stop me if it's not clear. This is the Bnei Yisoscha, famous piece on, on, uh, on, this, on the Indian of, of, of uh, Hanukkah. And it's easy to remember where it is because it's on his Maimorim, his essays on the Chodesh of Kislev. And it is Maima Chaf He, right? Hanukkah, Chaf He is 25. So let's look at this now. The Posik, maybe you want to get up uh, to Chumish, I don't know if it's necessary, but let's try and do it just with the, the text here. V'yes Yehuda sholach lefonov el Yosef lahoros lefonov goshna. This is describing the scene when Yosef has revealed himself to the brothers and now Yaakov Avinu before he goes down into exile. Now something we should preface by saying there's a concept in Chazal, the Ramban brings it, of Maisa Ovas Simon Labonim. Maisa Ovis, the actions of the fathers are a simon, or a sign, the bonim to the children. Meaning that the fathers, the forefathers, the patriarchs, they blaze a path, they, so to speak, they write the matrix of the future exiles of the Jewish people. Everything that the, the Ovis do, and, and say for Bracious specifically, really is a a signpost is an indication, is a microcosm of the world historical exiles which are going to follow. That you have to understand. So it's not just <clears throat> when we're talking about when Yaakov Avinu sends Yehuda down to Yosef in Egypt, this is something which has to be, will, will be writ large historically. So the Posig says, V'es Yehuda and Yehuda, Sholach, he sent. Who sent him? Yaakov sent him. Lefonov in front of him. El Yosef to Yosef. Lahoros Lefonov to teach in front of him. Goshna. Rashi says to set up a base of Medrash. Set up a place of learning. Now there's a couple of things that we might want to look at this posseg. Number one, why Davka did Yaakov send Yehuda? Why Yehuda? Also it says in this posseg twice the word Lefonov. Now, I don't have a makor for this, but it seems to me that this maybe is the, rem, the remez, the hint, to say that Lefonov doesn't just mean in front of Yaakov's descent into Mitzrayim, but this is something which is the archetypal journeying into exile. Of course, Mitzrayim is the prototypical, the archetypal exile. 
which contains within it all of the other exiles, the four exiles we've been describing. They are all contained in the exile of Egypt. So maybe the repeating of this word, Lefonov, indicates that it's not just talking specifically in that context, but Lefonov in the future, in the future of the Jewish people. Um, another point I'd like to bring out is it says the word Goshna. Goshna means to Goshen. Now, it's true <coughs> that it's not the, it's not a fantastically untypical way of putting to. There's a two forms, there's two ways you can say to somewhere, to a place in Hebrew. Um, if you want to look it up, it's, um, uh, have an article, maybe it's, yeah, you can look it up, okay. So, again, the word Goshna here is somewhat atypical. Because as I, as I was saying before, there are two ways in Hebrew that you can, you can say to a place. One, which is more common, more typical, is le, le Goshen. So the question is, why did the Torah choose to use a somewhat unusual um, construction here? Why didn't it say le Goshen? Okay. <clears throat> That's basically the first paragraph here. I don't think I'll translate it. So, this is basically what he said in the second paragraph. Anira, the the Hine, Yodua, the Golas Harisha, and Golas Mitzrayim, the first Golas. When we talk about the first Golas, I'm talking about the prototypical Golas, not the four exiles, which we discussed before. As Rashi says, that the four of these four Golashes, Minha, are the four Malchus, as we discussed, which they uh, ruled the world. And they they hikbidu olam al Yisrael. They oppress the Jewish people. Each one of these four malchias is ha uh, were sorry keneged. As I said before, one of the names, one of the four letters of Hashem's name, kaviyochu. And we, the Jewish people, are dvekim in that name. Hashem atem hadvekim by Hashem davka by Hashem by that name. That's where the Jewish people derive. That's our that's our con, that's our. It dabkut our kesha with Hashem is through that name. And now we have to understand the Golas Mitzrayim is this element which is this point which is above the other four Golases. And that is connected this um, which is called the Kutso Shel Yud. Now, <clears throat> the Kutso Shel Yud, if you look at the Tagim, the tagim are the, and what do you call them in English, the um, crowns on the tops of some of the letters in the Torah. If you look at the yud, a yud has a crown. That's called the kudso shal yud. So Mitzrayim, which is the prototypical exile, exists as, so to speak, the, where all the exiles emanate from, and that is the Crown the kutsa shall yud, the, the kotz, kotz means a thorn literally, something very small. And that is the shoresh, that's the root of all the four letters of the Shem Havaya, yud ke vav ke. And this is why it says, if you look up in the Posuk in Shmos, Aleph Yud base, it says that the Egyptians, it says, Vayekutsu mi b'nei b'nei Yisrael. Literally, it means they were disgusted by the Jewish people. But here, says Bnei Yisrocha, is being Maramez, that Mitzrayim is the Kutzel Shel Yud, the prototypical ex exile from which the other four exiles which will emanate. Therefore, in Golas Mitzrayim, there is wrapped up all of the other four exiles. And this is actually hinted to in the Posik, we want to turn over there to in Shmos, Beis, Chaf Gimel. That's when it says, Vayihi b'yomim harabim, and it was after many days. So, if you take the letters of rabim, you'll see that they're the Rosh Hashanahs of Romi, rabim, Bovel, base, Yud, Yovan, Amem, Modai, Modai, Porus, and Modai. It's the same exile. So, again, it's hinted in the pasuk that Mitzrayim, Vayihi b'yomim rabim, rabim indicate the four exiles which will emanate, which will flow from this Kutso Shalyud, the antithesis of the name Yud Kevovke, which flows from that Kutso Shalyud on the Yud. 
Okay, now the next thing he's going to talk about is as follows. <coughs> the Baal Gurariye, the Maharal, discusses the four exiles, and he parallels though, <coughs> excuse me, he parallels those to four powers in man. They are the Koach Gufani, physical power, Koach Nafshi, the I don't want to call it spiritual because spiritual is a bit vague in, in English. There's a power which is, let's say, the life force. It's actually quite a low power. It's not an exalted upper power. It's a power which keeps man going because it says, Hadam hua nefesh. It's the power of life, <coughs> which animals have as well. And that's the second power. And then there's the Koch Sikhli. The intellectual power, which of course is a power that man has, and the Koach Elyon, and literally an upper power, an exalted power, Hakolol Kulam, which includes, which joins together all of these. Excuse me. Now he's going to go through this. The Koach Hagufani, the pure physical power, is connected to. The nefesh ha dormemus sheba adam. Now another thing we have to explain here. There are four levels of life. The four levels of life are from the bottom up: domem tzameach, chaya medaber. Let's start at the bottom. Domem. Domem means mineral life. Mineral life is the lowest form of life. The next highest, next form of life is the, on the scale, is what's called tzameach. Tzameach literally means sprouting. It means vegetable life. Anything that can change, um, it's, it, that grows. Something which contains growth. The next level is the level of sichlis, which is the level of seichel. An animal, to a certain extent, has seichel. And there's the nefesh ha chionis, Shabo, which is this, I don't know how you translate chiunis, any ideas? Chiunis? Chiuni, I don't know what the word means. But the idea of it is that, that it. Like chaya. chaya, okay. Like a living force, yeah. But I, I'm not sure what he means in this particular. One second, I've got to. Yeah. So I made a note here. I don't know where I got this from. I think it maybe was my own idea. That maybe. It's a, the Koes HaChuyun is a power of life that recognizes that it's alive. Unlike a plant or a stone. Okay. But it's a higher level than a stone, higher level than a plant. It's called a Koes Nefesh HaChuyuni. And there's a, a Koes a higher level, which is what's called in some Svarim, the Koes, which is Medaber, which is man. The power to speak is that which separates man from the animals. And that's called the Koech, which is Kolel Nefesh Hamadaber Shabo, the speaking spirit. Okay. Now, the Koech of Bovel. Remember, we have four powers in a man. We have four exiles. We have four letters in Hashem's name. So, the first of those exiles, the Koech of the Malchus of Bovel, of Babylon, was Keneged the Koech Ha Nafshi'i. Nafshi meaning, meaning the ability to live. As I said before, the Posik says, Hadam hua nefesh, the, the, the life force in a body. So Babel was connected that, corresponded to that, was opposed to that, because what did the Babylonians do? They were Mavatl, the Avodas of Beis Amigdosh, which was the Korbanus. And the Korbanus are the, the Tikkun of the nefesh. As it says in the Posik, Nefesh kisakriv. A nefesh who, with that will bring a korban, or in another place it says nefesh kisecheto. All context with the, the, kor, the korbanos. In other words, the korbanos, when the Beis Amigdash was destroyed, the Babylonians severed the pipeline, the connection, which is the level of nefesh. Modai hayeneged the koecha gufani. If you remember, Modai Paras, the story of Persia, was to Lashmid or Larog to kill all of the Jewish people. They weren't inter in interested in, in converting us. They just wanted to wipe us out physically. 
לאבד, הגופוס, להשמיד, להרוג, לאבד, etc. יובן, חנוכה. יובן was connected the כוח השכלי, the power of the intellect. That's our Torah. It says when the Talmai invited uh, 70 sages to translate the Torah into Greek, and it says that when they did this, the three days of darkness went out to the world. This is one of the things we fast on, on uh, Sarah B'Tavis, on the 10th of Tavis. And Chazal teaches why the three days of darkness go out to the world, because the lion which had been formerly roaming free was put into a cage. When you take all the rich allusion, not illusion, the allusion that the Torah contains, an extra letter, uh, a, the lack of a letter, the lack of a vowel, a dot, a series of dots, the Torah is a code. When you take that code and you translate it into another language, it, even the most superior of all the languages, Greek, you basically put the Torah into a cage. The triumph of the Greeks was that they took the Torah And they said, look, your Torah is a wonderful book. You know, we've got it in the library. Oh, it's next to Plato and Socrates and uh, what's his name? Deepak Chopra. It's a wonderful book. Tremendous wisdom. But it's no different. They put it into a cage. There was, and we'll talk about this. Mirza Shem. We won't have to talk about it, but come the Sora Batavis. How the world became smaller. They put it into a cage. The Seichel, the Seichel HaTorani, the Seichel ha Eloki, the godly wisdom of, a, of, of the Torah, was made, was reduced, was put down. They captured it. They put an end to that. They made it into just another book of wisdom. And the Malchus Revis, the fourth exile, really a summation of all the others and an, an added thing with it. Because if you think about it, the Rome was first of all was Mavatl, again, the Korbanus of the second Beis HaMikdash. It was Neged the Goof. It was Neged the Goof, if you remember the stories that we read from the Gemara and Gittin on Tisha B'Av, how the Romans destroyed, for example, just one story over there about um, Tor Malka, about uh, Beta, how in Beta they, they slaughtered hundreds and thousands of Jews, and they fertilized the fields for seven years, with Jewish blood. And they wouldn't allow them to be buried. And the fourth bracha that the Rabbanon put into Birkas Amoz and Ateva Metiv, we put in that when they finally were brought to Jewish burial. It was a miracle that their bodies did not rot for seven years, and then they buried them. But the, the Romans, just as the Persians, that's the, so to speak, the Porus Amodai part of Rome, they, they killed us, they destroyed our body. They destroyed the Beis HaMikdash, which was, the, so to speak, the Babylonian aspect, the, the severing of the connection between Hashem and the Jewish people through the Korbanos. The Seichel, if you remember at the beginning, we discussed the Holy Roman Empire. Just like the philosophy of the Greeks, that was replicated in the attack on Judaism by the Christians. They tried to replace their... Our, our Holy Torah by what they called a, a New Testament. They, repla- they wanted to replace it. That was the attack on, on the Seichel. And as he says, he goes on to say this, I'm now on Chav Gimel, on the, on the, on the left-hand side there. Ad asher ba'avonus ha'rabim nilkadu b'reshatam in their nets kama alafim nefoshos b'nidchu v'hoyu l'cherpos o'ilom. This is talking about Christianity. Who sowed Habirur ha'achron ba'akvus meshicha ashe kimat kamohu lo nihiasa u'kamohu lo so so sif. From Hamer Yoyash, now he says in Meherah that Hashem Misbroch should shine aleinu. Barachim im o shvas yikaras kavodo shvas yikaras kavodo. We're waiting. That means Mashiach. And it will be Havahaya Hashem Lo Olam. Hashem will be the O Olam. Then he says as follows. Now I'm on Chavdala. Vehine Adala Malchus Heim Hakamim Bekoach Aklipos Al Yisrael. 
But these are, it's a Kabbalistic concept called the klipot, like a, a shell uh, surrounds a fruit. <clears throat> so the, the klipot surrounds the, the kedusha and doesn't allow it to, to penetrate, to emanate. <clears throat> And this causes that in the world we live in now, that the yichud of Hashem, the achduso, the unity of Hashem is not clear. It's not, we don't see it. That's the golas. And Jewish people are the goy echod, advekim, in the achdus of Hashem, as it says, atem advekim b'Hashem elokechem. And therefore, <coughs> that's the reason that, as we said before, that the klipos and the malchus are four. Because four, as we say <coughs> at the beginning, represents the alma, the peruda, separation from that central point, which is always separation, as the Maharal says, in four directions, as we mentioned at the beginning. And the Israel, the Jewish people, listen carefully, are the nekuda ha-emtsait, are the middle point, so you have four klipot, four exiles, four malchus, which are the world of separation. And the Jewish people, Vatem Hadvekim, we are Dovek in Hashem and we are the central point. Well, maybe I'll read what he says first here. Yisrael Heimak Nekudam, the Emtsa Vekava Yodata, Bechines Emtsa Meached Kola Katsa voice. There's an idea here that the center of something unifies all of the extremities, all of the sides. And therefore, when all of the malchiuses, these four malchiuses will be in this battle, in the personification of Rome, which contains all of them, Yoshev HaKol, the Nakuda Ha'achtus, everything will then return to that central point, as it says, Oz Efoch El Ha'amim Safa Brura Yachad Likro Kulam B'Shem Hashem. That's when Mashiach comes. There will be this battle and they will all return to that central point, which is Hashem, which is Hashem, which is Klan Yisrael. Ksiv. For Hayah Hashem le Melech al Kolaretz by Yomo, who Ye Hashem Echod, Ushma Echod. For Oz Tashuv, Amal Melucha, the base Israel. Then that's when the Melucha, the kingship, will return to Klan Yisrael. Goy Echod. We're the Goy, which is Echod. We are the ones that Ma'yached, we are the central point. Goy Echod, Baaretz Hadavakim. Ba'achtus Avaya Baruchu. Excuse me. That he says is basically he's explaining the Gur Arya. Now he goes on to explain. Remember, we started off with the Posik and we had several questions. But nearly, Sha'al Cain, therefore, the Malchus of Yisrael, who comes from Yehuda? Why did he send Yehuda down? Remember the idea of Yehuda going down into Mitzrayim is the idea of Yehuda from whom comes the Malchus, the Malchus going into exile of Egypt. Why Yehuda? Because if you look at Yehuda, look at Yehuda's name. You have a Yud, you have a He, you have a Vav, a Dalad and a He. And those are the letters of Yud K Vav K plus the Dalad. Yehuda has the shame Havaya which has the, the, uh, the ability to be misbattle the Dalad exiles, the four exiles, and return them to that central point. Sheyesh b'shmoi oisias Hashem havaya echad v'od nosev b'shmoi os Dalad. To indicate, ki malchus Yisrael ma'achedes ha'pirsim l'chol bo'olam achtus Hashem ha'miyuchad they are the ones Yehuda contains within them the name of Yudke Vavke and the Dalit. Yeah. The next thing he says, if you remember, we asked, why does it say Goshna? Why didn't it say Lagoshan? Because remember, Yaakov Avinu is sending Yosef, Mashiach ben Yosef, who will precede Mashiach, Mashiach um, ben David from Yehuda. So, he sent Yehuda down to Yosef to teach in front of him. That is, Sheyoro Haderech Lefonov, to teach all of the Jewish people the way. And that's why they'll be called by the shame of Yisroel, Goshna, 
Look at Goshna. Goshna are the four letters of the four Malchiuses which dominated the Jewish people. What's the Rosh Tevis? Goshna. I remember we said that there were four powers. The power of Gufani, the power of the Seichel, the power of the Nefesh, and the power of Achioni. So Gimel, Goshna, Gimel is Paras Madai, the body. Shin, Sin, is the Seichel, that's Greece. Nun is the Nefesh, that's Bavol, and Hakol, Chioni, that's, that's Rome. Davka, the Torah wrote Goshna, not Logoshan, to indicate that Yaakov was sending Yehuda down to Yosef Goshna into those four exiles. Rosh Hashanah, Gufani, Sichli, Nashi, and Hakol. Because as we said before, Hakol, Rome is the summation of all those three other exiles. And an interesting other, he brings over here as well that um, the letters of Goshna, Goshna, can anybody's good at uh, working out numbers? So let's work it out. What's Goshna? 300 and 58. 358, is that right? Yeah. Now, what is the uh, gematria of Mashiach? Shin is 300. Yud is 10, that's 50, and Ches is 8. Mashiach comes from the, the, his battle of Goshna. And that's going to be this battle. There's a concept of the Nachash HaKodmoni, the primeval snake, which carries within it the Yetzahora, which will also be in this battle at the time of, of, uh, of the coming of Mashiach. And Nachash is also 358. Okay, so he carries on here, but um, basically, what's this got to do with the secret of the dreidel? Well, it shouldn't be um, a surprise to you that the dreidel has four sides. And the four letters on the dreidel are Nes, Gadol, Haya, Sham. Nun, Gimel, Shin, Hey. The four letters of the dreidel are the same letters as the letters of Goshna, are the four letters which signify the four Malchuses. And think about the, the symbolism. You take a four-sided object and you spin it. And when you spin it, it becomes a circle. That circle is a hisbatlus of the, of the four, of the direction of four. It's not four anymore. It becomes a circle. And that circle basically is really writ large, the small central point, which is Atem Hadvekim Ba'ashem Elokeichem, the small central point, which is Yisrael, which is the Nekuda, which is the Kutzel Shel Yud. It becomes that little point. The circle, so to speak, describes the central point. So think about it, what you do when you pick up this dreidel and you spin it. A little innocent game. Basically, what you're doing is you're being this battle the four exiles, club pay the central point. Rob Bullman, as I used to say, and we'll end with this, it's interesting because there are two children's toys, one on Hanukkah and one on Purim. The children's toy on Hanukkah we've already discussed, right? The dreidel. What's the children's, to to the children's toy on, on Purim? The groga. In one, the hand comes from above, and the other, the hand, comes from below. The idea of Purim is that it's a his ararusa de la letata, an awakening from below. There's no mention of Hashem's name in the Megillah. Hashem is, right, the word Megillah is la galot et anista, to reveal the hidden. The Jewish people made that effort to reach up to Hashem, and therefore, the toy that symbolizes this shows us the hand reaches up. And in the miracle of Hanukkah, Hashem reached down to us with the miracle of the oil and the miracle of the battle. And the hand comes from above. His Ararusa de la Elo, it's called. An awakening from above. So there you have. 
the dreidel. A simple, seemingly innocuous children's game played in the firelight of the menorah glowing there silently in the back of the room. And this little dreidel contains within it the whole history of the Jewish people, the history of the world. Okay, any questions? I remember growing up I heard that um, in Israel the dreidel has uh, hay. Okay, so instead of seichel you'll say philosophia. Well, the Greeks' philosophy, they tried to... Re- okay. the, original, the original minhag was uh, with the shin. But even if you change it to pay, still you could say philosophy. You can go look at the stores, you won't find the pay. No, even around here. So that's true, it's true. They don't sell them here, right? No, it's, that's, uh, the minhag is for a shin. And for good reason, as we see from this. Right. Okay, gentlemen, all the best. Thank you. Pleasure.